uh, just one thing. I have to apologize. Uh, um, um, we had a handout that you, you now have uh, from Elizabeth, but the original handout was uh, thrown out by mistake, I guess, last night somehow. So what you have now is Elizabeth uh, on manuscript. So, <laughs> so the corrections, if, if it doesn't look perfectly professional, she, she asked me to apologize for her, but I'm the one who has to apologize because we lost it. So anyways, so um, Hugo. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Hugo Moreno from Reed College, and I'm truly delighted to introduce our next speaker, Elizabeth Millan, uh, professor of philosophy at DePaul University. Um, her uh, main areas of work are aesthetics, uh, German idealism and romanticism, and of course, Latin American philosophy. Uh, she has published uh, a book that I have uh, read many times and greatly admire. Uh, it's, uh, the title is Friedrich Schlegel and the Emergence of Romantic Philosophy. Uh, she has also co-authored a book with uh, uh, Barbell Frischmann titled The New Light of German Romanticism in both German and English. And she has written numerous articles on different uh, German figures such as Goethe, Fichte, Hegel and as well as uh, she has written on, uh, say, the figures of Ariel and Caliban in Latin American philosophy, pieces of exclusion of uh, Spanish in Latin American philosophy, and many related subjects. Uh, she has also done very valuable work uh, co-editing volumes on Latin American philosophy. Uh, one of them she co-edited with uh, Jorge Gracia, another one with uh, Arlene Sales, and I'm very lucky that uh, I'm also uh, part of, uh, we're together uh, co-editing a volume on Latin American aesthetics and a special issue for the uh, Canadian Journal of Continental Philosophy Symposium also on Latin American aesthetics. And her current project is a book length uh, uh, book. It's a book length study on Alexander von Humboldt and which she interprets as a romantic critic of nature. And today she's going to, to present a paper titled The Value of All Values in Latin America, Aesthetic Value and the Shaping of the Latin American Philosophical Tradition. Please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Milan. Thank you, Hugo, both for the introduction and for the collaboration on this new work on Latin American aesthetics because a lot of my work on Latin American philosophy has actually come because I want to teach a class to American, U.S. American students, and there just aren't any texts. So you have to create the texts in order to teach the class. And it frustrates me that in aesthetics, which is such a rich, which has such a rich tradition within the Latin American philosophical field, um, there just isn't much in English. So we're trying to fix that. And thank you, Alejandro, for organizing such a um, stimulating conference and giving us a chance to talk about very important issues in such a friendly setting, because it's been great to see a lot of people I haven't seen for a while, as well as some of the undergraduates <sighs> that I had at DePaul who are now at Oregon, and one graduate student I had at DePaul that I hadn't seen in a while. So it's been a great <laughs> conference. And as I joked, the only thing that has gotten me up at 4 in the morning is <laughs> my bladder because of the baby, but, um, <laughs> but I've had a lot to think about, so I'm grateful for that. Um, the handout is mainly so that I have some citations, and I'll, I have them numbered so that when I'm reading, you can just follow along. I thought that would be easy. Some of them are quite short, but there are a few longer ones, um, and since I, well, Mariategui is better known, but De Ustua's work may not be so well known, so I thought it would be helpful to have those claims there. Um, so I'll begin. I did change the title to The Value of All Values. As you see, uh, aesthetic value and the spirit needed to change the field of philosophy. So I had a more ambitious project in mind, but you'll probably be relieved that the project was narrowed down, so it's not very lengthy. Um, I left out things on the Baroque that I would have wanted to say 
including some remarks on Marti and Walter Benjamin. So I'm just sticking to Maria Pegui de Ustua and some critique of Rodo, all in the name of trying to see how looking at aesthetics more seriously would help us reshape the field of philosophy and make it more inclusive. So let's begin in Lima, Peru, November 3rd, 1926, with the great Latin American Marxist thinker Jose Carlos Mariategui. In a brief essay, Art, Revolution, and Decadence, this is the first citation, Mariategui writes, no aesthetic can reduce art to a question of technique. New technique must also correspond to a new spirit. If not, the only things to change are the trappings, settings, and a revolution in art is not satisfied with formal achievements. We're gonna come back to that because uh, my ultimate claim is that we need a sort of revolution in philosophy to really change the spirit of philosophy. Because what we've been doing is changing the setting, which is all right, and the trappings, but it doesn't go far enough. Further, he claims, the decadence of capitalist civilization is reflected in the atomization and dissolute nature of its art. In this crisis, art has above all lost its essential unity. With the latter claim, one cannot help but think of Oscar Wilde's complaint, one all too fitting for our current state of, cultural, of culture and the decadence of our capitalist civilization, that we know the price of everything and the value of nothing. So I'm returning to value here. Mariategui's entire philosophical project was rooted in a serious study of value, one that expanded to ethics and politics, as we saw yesterday in Omar's very eloquent and important presentation, but which was also always led by the branch of value study. And I know some people don't like the notion of value study, but I, I think for my purposes it's important to keep that in mind, that he had favored early in his career, namely aesthetics. His claims about art can guide us in thinking about a new spirit that might reshape the field of philosophy. Just as no aesthetic can reduce art to a question of technique, if we want to seriously consider the reshaping of the field that houses the branch of philosophy that is aesthetics, we cannot <coughs> limit ourselves to a question of technique or method. There must be a change in spirit and a recovery of the essential unity that has been lost in the field of philosophy. And as we think about ethics in the Americas and the specific tasks that Alejandro actually articulated well in his um, description of this meeting of developing, and I'm quoting him, developing ethical thought beyond the current hegemonic structures and configurations derivative of Western European and North American articulations. And that was part of the purpose of this gathering. Then I think we have to look seriously at the work of two Peruvian thinkers who each highlighted, and they're very different, so I, I'm skipping over that. That would be a book in itself, De Ustua versus Mariategui. Um, so I hope you'll forgive that skipping over. Um, we could return to it in the discussion, but it's not really germane to the point of my paper um, to get into that detail right now. Then I think we have to look seriously at the work of two Peruvian thinkers who each highlighted an aspect of value that remains neglected by philosophers, especially in the Anglo-American tradition. Maria Tegui, who I already mentioned, and Alejandro Octavio de Ustua, who lived and wrote a little bit earlier than uh, Maria Tegui. Each took aesthetic seriously as a study of value that could help reshape society and the very field of philosophy itself. In what follows, I will present some of the main strands of de Ustua's work on aesthetics, in particular, his claim that aesthetic value is the source of all value, or as he puts this, that aesthetic value um, is the value of all values. And that gets into some problems that we already sort of talked about, because I don't want to repeat the hierarchical thinking here, but um, that we can discuss. I will use De Ustua's insights to show some problems with one thinker's approach to a kind of aesthetic reform that was to be carried out in Latin America. The thinker to whom I refer is Jose Enrique Rodó, whose essay, Ariel, was a call for aesthetic unity in the face of US expansionism, but a call which, alas, rooted Latin American culture in yet another foreign soil. I will conclude with some comments and on how we might use the insights of Mariategui and de Ustua 
to carry out a more successful cultural critique than Rodeau was able to accomplish. I think that Rodeau was on the right trail in pursuing aesthetics as the tool for returning culture, for reforming culture, excuse me, even while the precise way in which he carried out his project failed. We can still learn much from Rodeau's valuable insight that aesthetic spirit is fundamental for leading Latin American culture forward and freeing its spirit from cultural domination. But first I'll talk about aesthetic value as the value of all values. And here we'll be coming to the third citation. In his, <coughs> excuse me, Estetica General, published in Lima in 1923, Deustua presents his integrated account of aesthetics, placing it within the study of values. He tells us that all the normative sciences have an independent end, which seeks to become a value created by imaginative intuition. This is number three. Logic, economics, ethics, law, and religion strive to achieve the values or ideals of truth, utility, goodness, justice, and holiness. Imagination is active in each of these disciplines. Deusta will go on to build from the observation that imagination is active in each realm of value study to conclude that the value of all values is aesthetic value, for only aesthetic value is sovereign and autonomous. Truth, Deustua goes on to explain, has instrumental value, but beauty has final value, and aesthetic activity is absolutely free activity, insofar as it is the only realm of value where the laws set are not set to coerce, but rather to guide. Then this is interesting that throughout his account, this term coercion comes up again and again in these other realms, whereas in the aesthetic, the laws are not coercive, which again, in terms of revolution and change, is, I think, very um, encouraging uh, in terms of a tool that we might use to free the field um, of inquiry from some of its shackles. In commenting on the distinction between truth and beauty, we see where Deusto is going with his line that the freedom of the aesthetic realm is freer than the freedom of the other realms of human value. This is number four. Unlike truth, the beautiful cannot be demonstrated. One understands its nature by intuiting or feeling it because the inspiration that engenders it or results from it escapes the exclusively logical process of deduction. Again, I think that's an important point because some of these, um, the search for truth, which is of course something any philosopher loves, um, is something that can be problematic and entrap us into these ways of trying to demonstrate and then these universal, I'm not against universal truths or universal sense of universal goodness, but it can trap us in its method anyway and then make us very judgmental about other methods. So this idea that the beautiful cannot be demonstrated is liberating in itself. I think, and rooting philosophy in something like the beautiful, it need not be the beautiful, because that's another problem with aesthetics, if we define it too narrowly. That's a good point Arthur Danto makes. Maybe part of the reason people aren't interested in aesthetics is because we make it so boring by only talking about the beautiful, the ugly, and the sublime. And I share that. So there, I also have my critique of Deustua. I'm not gonna present him as a hero of any sort, but. But this point, I think, is extremely important. Following Kant, or as I would prefer to say, following the truth of the matter of aesthetic phenomena. So we don't have to always give German <laughs> credit to in philosophical insights. Um, Deustua <laughs> goes on to emphasize that the aesthetic phenomena is disinterested. As he says, this is number um, five, it pursues no end exterior to itself whether economic, moral, or religious, its end is within itself. For him, that's the disinterested moment. The absolute autonomy of aesthetic phenomena is singular and powerful. Freedom is essential to both aesthetic and moral phenomena, and the Ustua links the moral and the aesthetic, claiming, this is number six, that an action of great moral value becomes beautiful. Beauty and goodness interpenetrate to such an extent that any effort to separate them would drastically change the nature of the action. And that's, of course, I think, indicated his current work by Colin McGinn, Ethics, Evil, and Fiction, where he does a really interesting analysis of how aesthetically infused our language is. When we want to describe something that has high moral value, we tend to describe it in beautiful terms that are beautiful. If somebody is 
an angel, delightful, etc. When somebody is uh, not a very nice person, um, some of the insults go to some of the <laughs> less attractive areas of the human body. So there is a sort of overlap between how we speak of of goodness and badness, and uh, the overlap of expressions of um, beauty and ugliness. Despite a common link to freedom, there is an important distinction, as Theosaur goes on in citation number seven to talk about, between moral and aesthetic phenomena. This is a long one, which is why I thought it was important to have it there. Moral phenomena involve the coercion of duty, imposed by a norm that that moral consciousness finds superior to its will. And of course, we only can be moral agents because of freedom, but then his analysis here is fascinating in that he goes on to talk about how coercive the moral law becomes. It's a function of freedom, but in a, in a way sort of limits our freedom. There is no avoiding this imper imperative quality of law, whatever character we may attribute to it and whatever influence it may exercise over freedom. Whether categorical, hypothetical, or persuasive, it remains an imperative that imposes a duty to which moral consciousness feels the need to submit even when it rebels. The moral norm, like the logical norm, is an inescapable condition which spirit ought to follow. Without fulfilling the first, the goodness of the action disappears. Without obedience to the second, there is no truth in thinking. None of this applies to the aesthetic phenomenon, in which freedom is all and any norm is sub a subordinate to it. A genius can alter in or destroy existing norms, creating new ones, as he offers new models of artistic production. Unlike morality, aesthetic judgment is not content to establish absolute and eternal dogmas. And some of those absolute and eternal dogmas are precisely the things that are so troubling. Sometimes I think um, in philosophy, we're opening people up to other traditions, nor does it feel the need to preserve them nor is it troubled by substituting some ideals for others, even when they are opposed. It is, on the contrary, this is a really important point, eager for diversity as an essential condition for what it is and does. When the ideal in the process of unification takes the abstract form of universality, which is what ethic ethical judgment constantly aspires to, aesthetic judgment rejects unity as anti-aesthetic. So you have this, in this citation, a very nice portrait of how you can break down um, and make more pluralistic an approach to reality through use of the aesthetic. Spirit for they was to, a, well, spirit ought to follow moral laws, but the aesthetic laws give spirit new directions, new laws, and as we shall see, a new order. The rejection of preservation of absolute and eternal dogma stressed by Leustua as he sketches the dis distinction between the moral and the aesthetic realms is precisely the sort of rejection that can pave the way to a cultural revolution. The eagerness for diversity emphasized by Leustua in his analysis of aesthetic judgment and the ensuing rejection of the abstract form of universality provide, in my estimation, the very tools a culture needs to seek liberation from oppressive practices that would bury the local traditions and sensibilities of a given region. If we look at the infamous debates over the humanity of the American natives, the tools used to trap them into the category of by nature barbarians are logical and ethical tools, not aesthetic tools. The natives were not, were marginalized, dubbed as by nature slaves because of so-called universal moral laws and deductive reasoning, which of course who could challenge, not aesthetic laws or, or aesthetic reasoning. Aesthetic laws are not, and well, I'll use the weasel phrase when properly used, Somebody might say, well, when ethical laws are properly used, this is true too, but I think history shows it's not. Aesthetic laws are not, when properly used, tools that marginalize groups of human beings. Indeed, following the Ustua's analysis, the space of freedom and the appreciation for diversity that grows from an engagement with aesthetic phenomena create a broad realm of freedom in which the human spirit can develop unfettered and an aesthetically informed human spirit would be a spirit open to differences and suspicious of dogmatic exclusionary classifications of human beings into hierarchies based on race, gender, or religion. And just as a quick aside, I do work a lot on the early German Romantic, and I have for a long time been thinking about the um, sorts of philosophical commitments that made them 
as a group, and someone like Alexander von Humboldt as well, open to other cultures, where someone like Hegel remained very closed and very Eurocentric. And, and I think part of the reason, it's a long story of course, but part of it has to do with their embrace of the aesthetic. Hegel also embraces the aesthetic, but not necessarily as one of the um, structures of his philosophical system. And also rejecting the system, which is part of what makes the romantic so fully aesthetic, sort of like Nietzsche in that way too. Um, there's no need for closure or fixing up borders, if we can put it that way. And the romantics are always, with their aesthetic breed of philosophy, talking about getting rid of borders between disciplines. They claim philosophy, poetry, and science should be made one. So they're, they're, not, af they're not afraid of overlap. And more scientific philosophers, it has to be in, in scare quotes. I think the pragmatists are like this too. And that's why they're marginalized. Philosophers do not like thinkers who don't want philosophical Minutemen minding the borders of the discipline. And there's something troubling about that. So they marginalize us because we're, we're not paying attention to those borders that they want very quickly in place. And a lot more needs to be done on this fetish with the borders that philosophers have. They love to put up limits on everything, um, which has never made sense to me. And in aesthetics, of course, you're playing with the limit all the time. And there's this idea of play. You're not taking seriously, in some ways, these limits because you know that there's always something right beyond the limit that is to be discovered. So <laughs> now, as I just talked about, when aesthetic laws are properly used, I'll talk about one case of a misuse and abuse of the aesthetic realm by looking at Rodo. And I do respect his work, but he makes some serious mistakes in his essay, Ariel. So unfortunately, misuses of the aesthetic realm abound. Uruguayan thinker Jose Enrique Rodo appealed to aesthetic spirit to free his culture, or Latin American culture, of the shadows cast by their northern neighbor. In his 1900 essay, Ariel, Rodeau was not misguided um, when he chose aesthetic spirit to lead the youth of Latin America in their struggle against the Caliban to the north. Unfortunately, Rodeau's approach in his famous essay is riddled with problems, not least of which is the imposition of European aesthetic ideals onto the spirit of Latin American culture, an imposition that overshadows the rich aesthetic tradition to be found within the Latin American tradition. And paradoxically, Rodeau is an important figure in that aesthetic tradition, but he ignores his very own tradition in this essay. He emerges as what Carlos Fuentes dubs the Europeanizer, who wants a cosmopolitanism which conciliates national identity and universal values of wholeness. Um, the only face of culture that emerges from Rodeau's account of the spirit of Latin American culture is the French cultural face. Anyone who's read that sees that immediately. Um, a foreign face. And so the vicious cycle of creating a cultural hierarchy continues with European culture setting the standard against which American culture will be measured. In such a move, the freedom of the aesthetic realm is hijacked with imperial interest taking the place of disinterested explorations of a cultural heritage. Such imperial interests led Latin American culture to the unenviable Sisyphean position of failing to live up to the European standard of culture, failing to be what it is not and could not be. Rodeau in his essay does precisely what is not required in the aesthetic realm. That is, he makes of one set of aesthetic phenomena, the French, an absolute standard. In Rodeau's essay, French culture becomes almost a categorical imperative of aesthetics something precisely that if we follow Theustor, the aesthetic realm should be free of. There is no coercion in the aesthetic realm. Should, there shouldn't be any. No set of fixed or universal laws, but rather a developing set of new laws, those laws of genius through which, as Kant told us, nature gives the rule to art. Culture must be pluralistic, not absolute. So chauvinism should not be part of any project of leading a given culture to freedom. Certainly it does not help spirit to develop in an autonomous way. Yet just such chauvinism lies at the root of Rodeau's cultural liberation project. For Rodeau turns a deaf ear and a blind eye to the contributions from the Latin American cultural tradition, tuning in only 
to the sounds and sights of the French culture. This is all the more troubling as he hitches his aesthetic project to a moral one of social justice, telling us, and I don't have, I guess I suppose that Rodeau is more well known, so I don't put him on the handout, but he's, it's not a long citation, they're just two. Telling us that, and this is Rodeau, as, huma as humanity advances, moral law will increasingly be considered as an aesthetic of conduct. Indeed, and this is a longer quote from Rodeau, he urges us, as he writes, never, us to never forget that an educated sense of the beautiful is the most effective collaborator in the formation of a delicate sensitivity for justice. So he's linking the beautiful to justice here. Dignity and inner nobility will find no greater artisan. Never will an individual be more faithful to duty than when he moves from believing that beauty is something that originates outside himself to feeling it internally as aesthetic harmony. And never will that individual know goodness more fully than when he learns to respect the sense of beauty in others. So Rodeau contrasts such dignity and inner nobility of soul, which is a kind of variation on this conception of the beautiful soul, to the base character of the individual guided purely by utility or self-interest. Those would be the Calibans to the north. The same sort of dichotomy that shapes Zeustua's meditations on the aesthetic are found in Rodeau's musings as well. The aesthetic realm of value, with its focus on duty and harmony, is contrasted to the concrete calculations that fuel an approach, an approach to life and to the world that, it, that is always tied to a particular interest of one sort or another. Yet, Rodeau particularizes the aesthetic realm, holding it hostage to this French tradition, at least in, in Ariel, and so tying it to a particular interest instead of cultural values. As Seussua makes his case for aesthetic value as the value of all values, he returns to the fact that in being moral, we submit to the moral law, while in contrast, the aesthetic realm demands of us no su such submission of will. Rodeau errs then in submitting Latin American culture to the French, French culture, so that the French aesthetic becomes a norm to be followed by Latin Americans. And I think that last point that <laughs> was raised about the fact that we have to sort of shift the fight so that we're not the victims or the marginalized areas of philosophy are not the victims, but the ones who are asserting their will is the way to go. Um, and, and Rodeau had all the tools. That's what's so frustrating to do that in his essay, but he, he doesn't push it through. This is a sort of aesthetic crime, the result of failing to see that in the aesthetic realm, Freedom creates its own order. It is not submitted to anything else, to any interest, and least of all to a foreign power. This is number eight. It's a citation from Zeustua, which is a, a longer one. As Zeustua claims, the aesthetic order is that which best satisfies the expansion of spirit and which best eliminates the coercion that is opposed to its nature. The whole aspiration of the aesthetic will is to achieve that order and the ideal. The moral order and aesthetic order thus have very different characteristics. The moral order at its best is a system of relations, of concepts, established by normative law. Even when it is, when it, um, sorry, when it may originally have been an order of images. The moral order presupposes the existence of an ideal of perfection, which it dogmatizes and imposes on the will and its relation to other wills. The aesthetic order is the ideal that is created by the spirit in the exercise of its freedom, Without that creation, there would be no other than the biological imperatives. The moral imperatives could not be explained. The moral order is thus based on the aesthetic order because only the latter is a creation. So that's his move to make this the fundamental um, ordering principle, the aesthetic. Now, some concluding remarks. Let's return to the two thoughts with which we began or which well, I began with them, and you were coerced into beginning with them, too. The two claims by Mariategui. We can look back over at his claim that no aesthetic can reduce art to a question of technique. New technique must also correspond to a new spirit. If not, the only things to change are the trappings, the setting, and a revolution in art is not satisfied with formal achievements. Um, perhaps the way to find the essential unity of which Zeusto speaks 
not only of art but of culture, is by recognizing aesthetic value as the value of all values. For, as Deusua tells us, and that's number nine, and this is where he makes his claim, that aesthetic value is the value of all values. Free activity never renounces its essential and supreme function, the creation of the ideal and its contemplation without practical purpose, its pure aesthetic function, the production of beautiful art, in which spirit aspires to attain that creative ambition capable of producing what cannot be done by coercing the medium. Again, it's free of this coercive function. This function is the spring from which other, which the other values drink their inspiration. There is therefore no exaggeration in calling this disinterested activity the value of all values. Spirit that aspires to its creative ambition, spirit that is not coerced, is a spirit that can lead culture forward as autonomous and which is not subject to the sorts of foreign domination that have so battered the field of philosophy. And it's true, I mean, philosophy, when, even when you speak of European philosophy, and that was the point that Enrique Russo made, it, you shrink down, and I've talked about that in an article, the world just shrinks, Europe shrinks, shrinks, shrinks down to just Germany and, and France, <laughs> Spain, Italy, Poland, they're not even present on that map either. England comes in too as part of it, that's the analytic tradition. So um, <laughs> it's a really disappointing uh, tradition that philosophy becomes a part of in terms of um, being subjected to a kind of foreign, not just a foreign domination, but a shrinking of the world too. So I completely agree that this, this idea of world philosophy really needs to be critically pushed forward so that it is a world philosophy and not just these collections of local philosophies. So I'll start over. Spirit that aspires to its creative ambition, spirit that is not coerced, is a spirit that can lead culture forward as an autonomous, as autonomous and is not subject to the sorts of foreign domination that have so battered the field of philosophy, making it an impoverished, over-specialized area that deforms the human spirit and the culture of any given society. In the last two decades or so, and if we look at the list that was used in the in the last presentation, which Grossia presents, those statistics have changed. I think there are more Hispanics in philosophy. Um, it's become more inclusive. But like art, if only the trappings or setting change, say a few course offerings in Latin American or African or Asian philosophy here with some courses on feminism there, and a few Hispanics on the faculty and the departments of philosophy, but no new spirit to infuse the field of philosophy, then there will be no change in the established order, an order that is exclusionary really to its core. Taking the aesthetic, uh, there are still people, and this wasn't so long ago, I'm getting older now, but it was 1990, I graduated from college, and I remember telling my professor, and it was, it was a good school in Maine, um, that I wanted to go, <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, so he should have, he had some good credentials anyway that I want to do Latin American philosophy, he told me it didn't exist. That's how I found Gracia, actually. I went, I'm very stubborn. I went to the library and found a special, and that's how I discovered Ophelia's work, too, that special volume of the Philosophical Forum, dedicated to, oh, Latin American philosophy, which supposedly didn't exist. So then I had to write to Jorge, because he knew it existed, and so went my history in philosophy. But that was still the case, and there are still people who at conferences, if I mention Schlegel, will say he's not a philosopher. So we're very quick to, and that's something we should be very skeptical about when people are quick to say something isn't philosophy. And it, there have been some ish discussions about some of these companions too, and people not wanting to include certain things because, oh, that's not philosophy. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very, that's a kind of colonial position to take too. You're not fully human. You're not really a philosopher because you're talking about these issues. <coughs> so it has become more inclusive. But um, until we have a new spirit that infuses the field of philosophy, there will be no change in this established order. So taking the aesthetic roots of philosophy more seriously would free, that's what I'm hoping anyway, the uh, field of philosophy and the practitioners who populate that field. Because, of course, the field is, is not an entity standing out there. It's populated by people who are all too quick to engage in the exclusion, too, from some of the maladies from which it and the practitioners suffer. So making the field more inclusive, just and good, I'll end on a very optimistic note, <coughs> it 
would be the result in no small measure because it would be rooted in beauty and other aesthetic um, dimensions of existence. So that's what I leave you for. It's, it's to prompt a discussion, obviously. I'm not solving all the problems, but I'll be interested to hear what you might have to say and how it connects to the other talks that we've heard too. Yes, uh, Mark. Thanks. Um, so, I, what I like about this so much is the bringing the aesthetic into the center. Um, and when you say it's the value of all values, um, I'm, I'm, here's what I'm wondering. I don't know um, the Ushua from, it's the first time I've ever seen the name or heard of it. So. I can't be commenting on that, but I'm wondering if there's still that the tradition out of which some of this comes is still too Kantian in the following sense. Um, Kant starts out by saying there are types of experience, mm -hmm. and then he has to get an epistemological account of how judgments are possible, mm -hmm. and he, he has to make a rigid distinction between moral es experience, aesthetic experience, you know, pr the practical, and you get a notion of disinterestedness, which has its place and one can make sense of it. But it seems to me that if you, if you stay within that framework and you, you get talk like the moral has completely different laws, I don't, I, the quote here, um, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll end up saying things like the moral order and the aesthetic order does have very different characteristics. Mm -hmm. And I would have said that the way your work's going you want to say no, they don't have different characteristics. If you really want the aesthetic to be at the center, then you've got to get over the, I mean, the, the tradition, we have to get over that traditional idea that somehow um, there are these distinct realms of experience, distinct mm -hmm. kinds of judgments, each with their own characteristics. And to see whether the aesthetic is pervasive in human being. And then one thing would follow from this, it seems to me the question is not about constraint. It's mm -hmm. and, and, and so I, I don't know if I just sense the, um, you know, like you say, the romanticism of this um, view, but the aesthetics is full of constraint. Mm -hmm. a any painter, dancer, and any human being knows that life is full of constraints on how you can make meaning, but there's still cre creativity. And so I think the issue isn't whether there are laws or whether, you know, we're freeing ourselves from constraint. Isn't it rather, don't we need to kind of move beyond that Kantian framework and say, look, the aesthetic is about the capacity for human meaning making. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's central. And it's central to the aesthetic, I mean, to the, to the ethical, you know. And that way you don't have the boundaries that then you have to try to overcome again. Um, well, some of what you said I, I would agree with. And then some of it, of course, I would want to tweak just a little bit. There, of course, is a connection between Kant. He mentions Kant, and he's been criticized, the Ustua has. And I, I'm actually glad this is the first time, well, maybe I'm not glad it's the first time you've heard him, but at least now you know about him. That's part of it, putting these thinkers onto the radar screen. Um, he's influenced by Kant. He's been criticized, the Ustua has, for being too derivative at times. So that's true, too. I have mixed feelings about <laughs> some of that because I don't think it's fair. There's a whole discourse within the assessment of Latin American philosophers um, that they're not original, that they're just copying everything from Europe. I don't think that's fair because philosophy um, has to do with critique and with dialogue with other figures. So it's not really fair to, uh, and you weren't critiquing him on that count, but uh, what I'm saying is it would be okay for me if he's following a Kantian line because I don't think that makes him less original. That was not your claim, but I'm just clarifying that. Um, but going back to those categories, of course it's true to create art. You have to create within constraints. But I think what Deusto is pointing out, which I'm using, of course, for a particular purpose, and that can sometimes lead to um, deformations of sorts, which you may be putting your finger on, um, that we can take some of these claims about how distinct they are 
Now, which doesn't mean, because he also is always pointing to the fact, well, they're also very similar, they're rooted in freedom, but the way the law is operating here is, is different. Um, and there's, a, again, this idea of the genius creating new laws, I think is very useful for this idea, going back to the opening claims by Mariategui of a revolution, a new change of order. So there is a connection between the aesthetic and the moral, but, um, and I'm still struggling with that because, well, as I was thinking after Charles' paper, I, I don't want to, um, and I don't think, I don't want to be turning to a thinker who's recreating hierarchy. So talking about aesthetic value is the value of all values seems to be doing just that. Uh, the reason I think it might resist that charge, that is the it being, placing the aesthetic as sort of the root from which all this is growing, is that it's not a fixed um, coercive kind of root, which isn't, again, to say, you can break down. I mean, it gets very complicated, the aesthetic in terms of the creation of art. But what I'm interested in is this sort of relationship to, um, and this is more subjective, more Kantian in that sense, what's going on epistem epistemologically when we're making aesthetic judgments, too. And I think that frees the mind up, too, in that way, to be more open to differences and not so bound by these universal sort of laws. And it's certainly, I think, true what Deusto is saying, that moral laws are coercive, they're imperatives. There's not an aesthetic imperative, really. There may be an imperative when you want to take a beautiful photograph. You know, there are certain constraints, you have to have the right light, there are technical sides of that. But in terms of making an aesthetic judgment, um, I don't think you can talk about imperatives. That's precisely why there's so much talk when you start to speak of aesthetic judgments of freedom and playfulness. This kind of, um, you know, homo ludens comes in there too, a sort of playful approach to life and openness there that is unsettled, but not unsettling in its lack of settling down somehow. A sort of um, ease with the openness of all of this. And I think it's when philosophers want to shut something down and put an end to it, which we all have a tendency to do, but I think especially in the realm of morals and laws and even sometimes political thought, is not there in the aesthetic. So it's more a sort of invitation to explore that openness and see where it might lead us. Um, but certainly your points are well taken and I, I have to be thinking about making those distinctions much more clear when I put this in its final form, so I appreciate your comments. Just one quick point. I mean, I would just suggest that morality is no more about laws than aesthetics is. I mean, that, 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 that's, that's a pretty fundamental mistake to think that it's about constraint again and imperatives. I mean, it's, it's about the realization of well-being and welfare, and mm -hmm. laws are simply, if there are any, they're, they're sort of summaries of what peoples have found useful in their engagements with life. And so I, I think that, the, again, this is a Kantian problem, I think, is okay. that it's so... It, to think of morality as having these imperatives Mor and laws and then if we could just figure out what they were, rather we're trying to live a beautiful life and that's why the aesthetics is, um, um, you know, categories like harmony, unity. Unity is mm -hmm. not a bad thing. It doesn't close stuff down. No, there can no. Be, there can be plenty of freedom that when to have a unified, sometimes a unified situation is one that's very fulfilling and opens up possibilities for meaning. It doesn't close them down at all. So I'm just, I'm skeptical of the fact that we, you know, the, the need to say, to, to bring laws into this at all at any level. Well, but even if, I mean, and you're, you, you're right, I may be guilty of that because the Usto is influenced by Kant and I guess I am too, but if, even if you go into something like Aristotelian ethics or utilitarianism, there is a calculation going on there, even to find that golden mean. It requires some sort of judgment, of course, and a sort of flexibility. So I, I would agree with you there, but you're always measuring something to find what it is that you're supposed to do, whether you're a consequentialist, a Kantian, an Aristotelian. I think you can't really, and you're, you're right, there may be then, Deusto is putting it in very strong, and I was repeating that because it, I thought it was useful for my purposes, but also close to the truth. 
even if we're not going to talk about imperatives and laws and ethics, there is a sense that there's some measure you, you, should, you should follow in order to get to goodness, um, which I think is not there in, in the aesthetic and reaching a judgment that something you, that has to do with feeling and sensibility, which has to be present also in ethics. But I think it's guided by something um, much, I would, I won't give up that word coercive. It's, it is more coercive, I think, in some ways. Now, it depends. Here we'd have to get into a discussion about um, whether we're um, universalists or relativists with regard to ethics. But if you're a universalist and you think there's something objectively good, just like the laws of gravity, you are going to be coerced. You don't feel it. If I jump out the window, <laughs> I'm not going to fall up. I fall down, and I know that the law of gravity is acting upon me. But I think a universalist would say, um, in ethics too, moral laws work, and um, you can't go against them. At some point, you will pay the price, so to speak, of trespassing the moral law. And I don't think the same thing is operating with the aesthetic realm. That's all I would say. But I appreciate your, your, your points, because you're right. You can't so glibly go over that, and uh, maybe I was too quick to do that because you raised some important points and I, I do appreciate that. Um, I have a question and the question is about uh, the concept of genius. Mm -hmm. And here's what, what, uh, what I find problematic with this is that it seems to me the way I, will, I read the concept of genius is as a kind of mirroring of rational subjectivity, the ego cogito. Mm -hmm. And I, the way I read the ego cogito is through the question of coloniality, that is, as the, as the construction of the ego cogito, cogito over against another. Mm -hmm. The ego cogito is irrational, the other turns out to be the irrational, and then the aesthetic that comes out of that is mm -hmm. aesthetics that requires the relationship of sensibility to the rational, mm -hmm. which is a European rational, and okay. then there is this irrational that we could call uh, genius, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I have two questions. One question is, how could we understand something like indigenous art when it doesn't come from a genius, but it comes from a question of rela relationality. So it seems to me that Kant would not be able to speak to that. And my other question is, isn't it the case that if we follow the question of coloniality, then it turns out that a decolonial term would be precisely to begin to talk about those aesthetics that are not mm -hmm. constructed in the difference between the ego cogito and it, the irrational, but they begin from another experience of sensibility entirely, like something that I think I would want to suggest, but just in passing, is what I see when I go to the museum in Mexico, to mm -hmm. the anthropological museum, and I compare it with the uh, European uh, appropriation of the Greeks. Mm -hmm. Well, now I don't necessarily, although I put my cards on the table, to be honest, about my own Kantianism, but I don't want to pollute completely with all of those Kantian <laughs> commitments because, and it's hard, it, that's a challenge because, and I think that's something that actually is a general problem with work that is to be done on, on Latin American thinkers and bringing them out and that's something we have to be careful about in the collection on Latin American aesthetics too is freeing these thinkers from these shadows, which is not to say, as I said before, that um, there's any crime in being influenced by thinkers who you think have discovered some truth before. You know, why not turn to them? But so I think we can also free some of this talk of the genius from some of this idea of the European rational as the sort of uh, teleological principle to which we're going and not necessarily see then the, the work of, you know, native works of art is somehow not living up to that Greek European standard of beauty. So that's part of why I think really reflecting upon what it is that makes the aesthetic unique in some way as an area of philosophy. And speaking of marginalization, the aesthetic realm has continuously been marginalized by philosophy as well. We, we know that. Kant, who did bring it more to the, the attention, but it, it, it kind of faded, and I think you still have that stereotype that aesthetics is not as important as ethics somehow within the, the field of, um, of studying values. So um, 
I'm thinking that the decolonial turn isn't precisely recognizing the importance of aesthetics because that, again, um, I think would open the door to also looking much more seriously at some of the contributions made by Latin American thinkers, as we've <coughs> seen within the APA. If you do organize sessions, you organize a session on logic for the Committee on Hispanics and Philosophy, you get a bunch of people who come in to see that. They think this is important. Um, they just don't think of the Latin American tradition as offering them any important um, insights into aesthetics. So, so I think uncovering that would be useful. And then the question that you're asking would need to be asked, of course, too, because it's not as if all Latin American thinkers are saints and don't have blind spots. So they might actually have, as Rodó had a blind spot, to the contributions, the Latin America, the aesthetic contributions from Latin America itself. Um, and that would be then the question to be asking is, um, are these thinkers any better situated with some of their aesthetic commitments to appreciating the work, the, the works of arts of native cultures and the sorts of pieces of art that you're talking about in the museum in Mexico City? I don't know if that answers your question to your satisfaction, but. <laughs> uh, Nelson? Um, well, let me begin w with a footnote, it, and, and, and it is that I think now that we are getting to the final end, and maybe this is actually a, a, yeah, a comment for the next to, to yeah. the other, yeah, yeah. So, but, uh, um, but, <laughs> but no, <laughs> I, I, I would want to, to put on the table for us to continue thinking about, right, uh, whether mm -hmm. this question of Latin American philosophy that had been, you know, we have all many of us have been uh, talking about. Mm -hmm. But I am still um, concerned, right, about the understanding part of the task of, you put it, of the decolonial turn, as you saw it, or the decolonization, somehow having, you know, vindicate Latin American thinkers in the, in the U.S. American context. Mm -hmm. And the APA being, you know, that, that place where you sort of do that job or which I'm not saying that that's not important. What I'm feeling, I think that is very confining and it could uh, still operate within, within the logic that precisely, if it is um, excluding Latin America now, it will be excluding something else later. Because it's still, the, the, the logic is still being the same. Yeah. And what it's been trying to do is to vindicate, to, to represent, to get it, to, to, to have these folks in the map out there. Um, but still, like playing the role. Okay, so we're playing the role as the Latin American is here, and we want to say, well, maybe, maybe we're part, of, part, of, part we are that, and part we are not. And and mm -hmm. so, why not trying to foster that other logic? Sometimes it can happen by bringing these figures, but sometimes yeah. I think that no, that we, that it is easy to stay caught in in the in the, in the same logic. Uh, perhaps in the spirit of playfulness and freedom of mm -hmm. breaking those logics, I would mm -hmm. I would ad advocate for um, an, an aesthetic intervention that uh -huh. goes out of that, of, of, of that logic. But uh, mm -hmm. now, the more directly with your, uh, the substance of your presentation, I mean, I think I understand your concern with ethics. Right? Mm -hmm. Ethics sometimes leads to moralism, rigid, rigidism, mm -hmm. and then to violence and all kind of exclusions in mm -hmm. the name of the good, in the name of the right, and right. so on. And in that context, it is certainly, I think, um, good to bring uh, elements like aesthetic freedom, and playfulness mm -hmm. right, to sort of break those boundaries, to, to sort of create another kind of culture that is mm -hmm. not a stock and ends right. up betraying ethics in the name of ethics, for instance. But <laughs> I wonder though that, I mean, I can see a similar picture with aesthetics, beginning with aesthetics, where uh, you begin with aesthetic freedom and then you jump into disinterestedness mm -hmm. because you're disinterested, but you're disinterested even to the plight of another who is in suffering. And then to, yeah. to exotic, narcissistic self-isolation <laughs> based on the enjoyment of the senses, right? And at that moment, just, no. like, <laughs> ju just like ethics can lead to moralism. No, but because yeah, yeah, I think that right. you are doing something with ethics that you're not doing with aesthetics. Uh -huh. But in that moment with aesthetics, when you see that, that kind of pathological direction, I think that just like 
when ethics goes wrong and you need like aesthetic value to intervene and to mm -hmm. help breathe the air, at that moment right. you need ethics okay. to take the subject out of that self-isolation to disinterest from disinterestedness and to show not because disinterestedness can turn into indifference. And ethics is the one that can take out that path of, of indifference and make it into non-indifference for certain kind of plights mm -hmm. that takes the subject out of that disinterestedness and playfulness into the into the mode of must respond, <laughs> even if it is <laughs> ugly, even if it is not aesthetically pleased, you know, even if it is not, even in spite of myself, I must. Uh, and the two figures that come to my mind representing the two pathologies in question, that is the supramoralistic violence and the supra-aesthetic uh, uh, that can in turn violent, I think about, I wonder what you think. Uh, let's say Hitler to some extent as the ultra-moralist, religious and so on, and then the other, the other one being Hannibal Lecter. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Hannibal Lecter, uh, the sociopath, but also illustrated in some way how this guy enamored with opera and classical music mm -hmm. and so on, he can actually kill someone at the rhythm of the mm -hmm. music while he is being playful. And you know, if playful to the extent of not only no indifference, but actually thinking that even another human life can be an object of certain kind of playfulness. And finally, I wonder if what you are after, I don't know, I'm trying to think how, because you still have a point about this problem with ethics. And um, Jean-Paul Sartre talked about the spirit of seriousness, mm -hmm. right? to which then he counterposed some level of, of playfulness that sort of needs to go against the spirit of seriousness. Mm -hmm. But the spirit of seriousness is not just it's not ethics. The spirit of seriousness of this rigidism, of this uh, fixation with divides, right, with all that you're criticizing, the spirit of seriousness can actually take place in ethics or aesthetics or epistemology yeah. or, in any, in, uh, or in any place. Uh, so both playfulness and ethics can go against the spirit of seriousness. Just a, a thought. Yeah, that's true. And th some of the concerns that were raised in the first question are present there in, in your points, too. I would stress, I mean, first I would admit there are a lot of <laughs> wrinkles I still have to iron out. So I'm not going to pretend that these aren't um, things that I, I need to address more seriously. But I would say as a kind of defense of what I'm trying to do is that the, what you mentioned is a departure point that is, and following the Ustua too, to be taken seriously. I don't see, and in, in what I was presenting, I think in the paper, I was talking about some of the unique aspects of the aesthetic but not, and, and criticizing some of the limitations of the ethical because of what you so nicely presented. It, it can lead to all sorts of exclusions, which is not to say, and that's why I do mention Rodo, that the aesthetic can't suffer from those as well. But it's more this idea of a d departure point. And of course, you're absolutely right that they have to come together because, and especially with this point of the disinterestedness leading to indifference, that is a serious problem. And you don't want, if you want, and that's why I began with Maria Tegui, yeah. um, who is the thinker who really does push the aesthetic to the ethical, to the political. So there's a connection there, but I, and I haven't presented it as clearly as I, I would like to, because it's, it's a hard case to make, but I'm working on it, is that by rooting it in the aesthetic, there's more room for the ethical and the political, and it precisely for not having this indifference, but for having an, a care towards others that's inclusive and not sort of dominated by exclusions. That's easy to say and, and harder to, to prove and show, but, um, but I, I like your point about this idea of the aesthetic needing, of course, the um, imperatives of the ethical, especially in terms of you must respond to an injustice in that way. So, um, <laughs> and your mentioning of Hannibal Lecter is a very, that'll keep me motivated as I'm trying to <laughs> sort that out because clearly I don't want to end up in a position where um, <laughs> this monster is somehow um, let loose. And, and you do have to be careful because, but, <laughs> but there is a point also in the order here, um, not in the ordering project, as I was talking about, but just the kind of almost temporal order. The, if the aesthetic comes first and then the ethical, I think it's a cleaner starting point. Um, then if you put the, the ethical first, maybe, and then the aesthetic. Um, 
So I think because of that playfulness and openness, uh, you're leaving more space for freedom there. Even if you're going to have to then get to the imperatives, like you must respond, you will not turn your back through this kind of disinterested playfulness on actual instances of suffering. So they have to be combined eventually, but it is about where the starting point is. Of course, even as I say that, I'm not liking what I hear from my own mouth because I've learned from the romantics not to be a foundationalist. So I don't want any absolute first starting point at all, but I think as a general sort of area in which to start, not with a principle necessarily, but a kind of maybe aesthetic sensibility, which would lead people forward, which might not be as confined as a sort of ethical sensibility, if, if that makes any sense. But I, th I thank you for those um, comments because it, there is um, a lot of work to be done, but I won't give up. I guess part of it is because of it. Also behind what I'm doing is a desire to bring a little more respect to the aesthetic realm, because I think it's often just cast aside as something not nearly as important as the ethical. And, and I think people aren't aware of, of some of the problems that are caused. There are problems caused if you completely divorce them. So I don't want to do that. But um, there are also serious problems if you ignore one um, and only focus on the other, because they both are important to understanding what value is and how to live a better, just human life. So I think that needs to be, um, the pe people don't take it seriously because it seems so playful, and that is the problem too. But I agree with the spirit of what you're saying. Probably the letter too. <laughs> Thank you for your paper. Um, so uh, I w I'm wondering now after hearing this discussion whether actually it would be important for your paper to draw the distinctions between the Ustua and Maria Tui. Oh, maybe, yeah. Right, right. because uh, the Ustua is grounded on, on, on Kant where Maria Tui isn't. Mm -hmm. and, so ma so and actually that tension it's in itself might be interesting. Mm -hmm. And Maria Tui clearly has, as always, a very you know, eclectic lineage of where his aesthetics are coming from. Yeah. But one of them is, of course, Nietzsche, right? And, and so he begins to look at art as uh, modes of affirmation mm -hmm. or degeneration of, of, of life, right? But my point, my point is, is connected to what Nelson was saying right now. One of the things about that essay, Art, Revolution, and Decadence, is that what, what he's, he's interested in is to say in that revolution and decadence mm -hmm. that he understands almost similarly to Nietzsche, a kind of affirmation of life or, or, mm -hmm. or, or a, you know, depletion of life, uh, can be present already in one artwork itself, you know? So it's not as if we have revolutionary art here, right? right. And then decadent art over here. Mm -hmm. And actually when I read this, he said maybe art for Mariate, and I don't know if this is my question, thinking about art might be a, a matter of exer exercising a kind of discernment, mm -hmm. constant discernment between somehow like revolutionary or life affirming aspects of art and, and, and not and the opposite of that, right? And in that case, and then that ties in with the end of the seven essays when he says, I'm going to put a, you know literature on trial, mm -hmm. right? And then he mm -hmm. seems to be inserting a kind, I don't want to say moral judgment because that's, that has baggage, but a kind of discernment or a kind of judgment. And that might be important in terms of Nelson's question because maybe art allows us, uh, allows us to see tensions between something like, you know, the dead moralisms and coercive sense of law. You see what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, a kind of creation or a creative spirit that doesn't want to be yeah. petrified in that law. And that tension might be something that art, for Mariette at least, is able to inform us about mm -hmm. and, and tell us you, we need to be discerning about this tension. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe other, other phenomena are not as good as, 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 as engaging us into that kind of discernment that is different from a moral discernment, but it's an, a, di a discernment between maybe freedom, 
you know, and 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 imposition or coercion or something like that. I don't know. I don't know if I've been clear, but but that discernment, I think, that that, that Mariati might be engaged in, is is might be helpful for your. Well, actually, that is really helpful because I think that going back to the first question and Nelson's point too, one thing that I may have, well, I was sloppy about, I suppose, is Mariatigi talks about art, but then I and Deustua are talking about aesthetics. So yeah. and there's a big difference yeah. between art, the object of art, and aesthetics. However, we're going to understand that yeah. as this branch of value study or as the aesthetic experience. Um, so that <laughs> raised that confusion, well, or it made the point that was first raised in by the first question um, that, yeah, obviously there are limits in the production of art. So that's one thing. Then there's the side. I mean, art is complicated, of course. There's the appreciation of art from the viewer's side. And I think you're right. I think that's where Mariategui is going when he pushes then into the ethical and the political there, that somehow being exposed to that art and having the art there as a sort of dialogue partner is something that helps um, cre expand sensibilities. And and I would, I think it's Eustwa's approach, and you're absolutely, I mean, that's true. I, more needs to be said. I just didn't, um, I already felt bad for getting into such detail with the positions and then adding an, an analysis of the, of the distinction between them may have been, especially for the last speaker on the last day, a little bit too much for everybody. But, but you're right, that difference between Nietzsche and Kant is there too. I guess I also didn't want to have that discussion take over um, for the reasons I've mentioned, although I think there's no problem in doing that, but it can look the wrong way somehow that now we're talking about Kant and Nietzsche instead of, and that's what often happens no matter what, is that the discussion will go to those figures, the Germans, and then then the two Peruvian thinkers kind of get lost in the shovel. But you're right. To talk more about that distinction would also clarify some of these these tensions here because I, I do agree that it's this art seeking the tension between these coercive laws. And so what the discernment in the viewer, what kind of discernment's going on, that's what is could be revolutionary too for the society. So that's very important. Um, and um, I, I definitely will highlight that more clearly. So I thank you for that. Charles. Philip, if I had been uh, thinking with you during this presentation and thinking about an emphasis, I think you used point of departure. I'm thinking of origins. Mm -hmm. Uh, in relation to uh, what you're calling um, morality and moral law and aesthetics. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> and what I would like to do for just a moment is to draw a possible uh, distinction between morality as you're thinking of it mm -hmm. and ethics with regard to the question of the uh, beginning sites mm -hmm for our perceptiveness and the way in which we put things together. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's the case, I believe it's the case, that the first written use of the word ethos in Greek had to do with the places to which wild pigs returned in the evening <laughs> after they had been hunting all day. They returned to their, uh, their ethia. And I think that Homer uses the word again uh, in, his, in a very early instance concerning a horse that had been captured and was held in a stable in bonds. Mm -hmm. And the horse breaks loose and races across the river and back to the fields of his. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I think the phrase, I don't remember it literally, uh, word for word, but he, the horse glories in his ethos. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where he belonged. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where he, as it were, the horse, <laughs> let me put it this way, found himself. Mm -hmm. Now, if we understand, that that's th this doesn't prove a thing, of course, to carry a word back like that. <laughs> but um, 
If we understand ethics, the word, in terms of ethos, mm -hmm. and if we understand ethos as a both naming a, a particular dwelling site, a particular mm -hmm. place of life, uh, of particular lives, mm -hmm. and if we think of that as originary, then we would begin, I should think, with the specifics of our place of life and others uh, to the extent that we can know them and understand the origins of aesthetics mm -hmm. oh, I see. in terms of dwelling places, mm -hmm. specific dwelling places, mm -hmm. uh, places in which one is able to know oneself in common with others uh, and find, as it were, uh, home is a little bit mm -hmm. too gentle here, um, but nonetheless find points of order. Mm -hmm. And we would not need in that instance to understand ethics, uh, if I may put it this way, uh, to, f uh, to put ourselves into a Kantian framework. Right. Well, that goes well again with the, the, the opening question of Frank. His name is Mark, is that right? Um, and that's true. I, I'm following, I'm guilty of following Kant too, mostly with Deussel, of course. That's, <laughs> that's, that's what I was um, doing um, <coughs> because I was uh, seduced, I guess, also with this idea of the aesthetic as the value of all values um, as a new root. A and going with, I like this imagery of the dwelling place. Um, but hmm. uh, I just, I do still think that, well, I guess what I would say is there's almost a reciprocal relationship between the ethical and the aesthetic. So there's no, there's oftentimes no reason to choose one over the other as long as they're both being treated on equal footing. I would, though, still want to make the argument that I think in times when there's a radical change called for, we might actually get further if we start with the aesthetic, but again, always keeping it in connection with the ethical. But both of those places um, would be, depending, I suppose, on where we want to go, we might want to go first to one and then the other, and maybe... Um, the departure point would change depending upon what the um, destination would be, if I can use, I'm not Homer, so it doesn't sound very poetic. But um, I think that there, um, I'm still uncomfortable with wanting to put the ethical as sort of the, the origin of, of all origins, so to speak. I think they work together. I guess that's all my argument would need to be is a call, it's a modest call for, for making the aesthetic present always when we're going to be talking about values alongside with the ethical because we're missing something important when we ignore it. Um, and I think part of the openness that the aesthetic gives to us could be an important tool for reshaping the field of philosophy too. So there's a sort of cause I have here too and that's maybe the problem. Ends with dwelling sites. We wouldn't, one would not need to use. I didn't hear the first the part of that. What's that? I didn't hear the first part. Perhaps if one, if we began mm -hmm. with sites of dwelling, yeah, uh, the notion, of the phrase, the ethical, mm -hmm. uh, would be misleading. Uh, right. That okay. again, to my ears, oh, okay. uh, uh, has a certain Teutonic ring to it, mm -hmm. and. Um, a certain that use of the word the mm -hmm. ethical uh, loses the diversity mm -hmm. that I think probably you and I both right. are very interested in. Yeah, well, that's a very good point. So maybe going back to talking about this ethos and um, having that more open. Yeah, that 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 would work. The enemy then is gone in a way by just not talking about it in those ways, <laughs> putting the Z beforehand, right. So, so that um, 
I guess in my, it's almost a quixotic, you know, battle, but it, it's, um, it's just this idea of the injustice with which a lot of philosophers just dismiss aesthetic considerations as somehow not pertinent to political change, not pertinent to social justice issues, and so partially because of some of the issues that Nelson mentioned too, that it can lead to some sort of um, dis disinterestedness that leads to indifference, and who wants that? Um, but I think we're, we're missing an important part if we're not looking, but maybe by just thinking of a term a value term that is inclusive of both these dimensions of how we approach um, living a good life, and which is filled with beauty and respect for others and justice that would um, do the work too. And then, of course, some of the limitations of the Kantian approach <laughs> come very quickly to the fore and maybe um, Nietzsche would be, if agreed to follow partially, not, not all the way, but but partially too. So, uh, yeah, I, I can agree to that. I think it's a very good point you raised, and I'll stop talking about B as a girl. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm guilty of maybe um, creating a not a straw man, but fighting against something, creating it so that I can show that the aesthetic is as important as I want it to be, by then diminishing some of the importance of. Ethos. See, I didn't say the ethic of this class. So <laughs> thank you for that. I'll, I, I'm going to take that. No, it's all very helpful um, to me. Thank you. Let me, let me make a. Oh, yeah. let, me, let me make a, a suggestion uh, because obviously what you can tell from the uh, this from the questions that I think that the, the part of it which uh, uh, some may resist is the. I mean, there's this word disinterested, right? Can be understood in so many different ways. Right. And there's a Kantian way of understanding that uh, may be problematic here. Uh, I, I actually thought that at least somewhere in here in the paper, you were making this sort of argument, and, and maybe this is where, I don't know, suggestion, may, the way you may want to uh, present it. Uh, that I, I agree with you that uh, one reason uh, that the art or the aesthetic is uh, many, I mean, it's, it's many times not taken seriously by uh, some philosophers. I have to be very careful. Some, and right. they're not in the room, okay? Um, <laughs> You're underlining that too. Yeah. Right? <laughs> they're not in the room, okay? Some <laughs> philosophers who, who, who are very concerned with ethics and politics, I mean, I, 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 I'm very sympathetic to you, right? In mm -hmm. other words, their attitude is like, well, you know, what's, what, what can we learn from our aesthetics? Mm -hmm. uh, especially, bec so here the disinterested part comes in because mm -hmm. Uh, the sense in which uh, art and aesthetic may seem disinterested is in the sense that it doesn't explicitly always has a political and moral message, right. right? But that doesn't mean that it doesn't function in some political and moral ways, in ways that even politics mm -hmm. and ethics uh, is not able to. I mean, for example, some of the stuff that you say like ex is an example of, of liberation, Right of some sort, which other activities is not. It's an example of freedom, an example of revolution, mm -hmm. in ways that. But it doesn't have to have the message, right. a political message, to have that kind of incredible political and moral power to it. So I think it's right. a, 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 that. I think that's well. A in fact, the art that becomes too much like that becomes. Yeah. It's not art anymore. One could argue it's just propaganda. So. Y y in a way, you can't tie it so tightly to that one explicit purpose. And you're right, even though it doesn't have the explicit political and moral purpose, there are forces there that can be used for political and moral change. And so that is part of what I was trying to express, too, that um, you can't just, and you're right, some, <laughs> and no one in this room, but um, it, it's often absent. And I think it's less absent, but that's why I'm so interested in bringing attention to the tradition within Latin American thought, because I think in Latin America there's been a clear, much sharper turn and embrace of the aesthetic than there has been in the Anglo, the German, even the French traditions, although, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the romantics, but I think it's even stronger in, in Latin America, and I think that's why I wanted to talk originally about the Baroque, because there you see very early on, and we have a very good article on the Baroque in the symposium volume, by Lois Zamora, 
the Baroque was used very early on and Baroque art was used to help the natives maintain a presence in that colonial society. They snuck it in. It was such a busy art form, those facades. So it was easier for them to sort of sneak in their images that were important to them. And so they kept a hold of their past that way. And it wasn't, in that way, aesthetics not being taken seriously and art not being taken seriously was a salvation because nobody was going to look too carefully at that. So they were able to smuggle things in. And if you look at the history, a lot of the preservation of native culture is done through aesthetic elements of the culture, whether it's food or art, or painting, architecture. So I think um, that can, that lack of explicitness can sometimes be a nice way to sneak things in so that people aren't aware of what kind of power is present in the work of art itself. So that's, that's a whole other side of the discussion that I think is really important, which is why the Baroque and the, now another German thinker, Walter Benjamin, also does interesting work on, on the Baroque, and I think there's an interesting connection to be made there. Because I also do think it's important to always be bringing these conversations together and not treat, not ghettoize the Latin American tradition as if it's somehow just doing things on its own in, in complete isolation from the other thinkers. So, um, And Benjamin, too, is a kind of marginalized figure. Why? Because he took aesthetics seriously as well, and he's writing on topics that... So he could never get a job. <laughs> and, um, well, that was the least of his worries at the end. But um, that's, that's a problem, too. They don't, people didn't take him seriously as a, as a thinker. So. Um. Ulo? Yeah. Um, I think that the, uh, it's very important to not limit our conception of the aesthetic to art. Mm -hmm. I think that the aesthetic can be productively used as a right. model for, for even thinking uh, the plurality of experiences, the plurality mm -hmm. of cultures. And in that sense, the uh, aesthetics should be thought of in, in opposition to, say, something like logic uh, more than anything else. Uh, and I think that, that uh, there's a, a, a very good tradition within Latin American philosophy that have thought of the aesthetic in this term, not particularly mm -hmm. the school of maybe Vasconcelos or mm -hmm. Jose Gauss, uh, but also in the uh, American pragmatist tradition, uh, people like uh, mm -hmm. Peirce and, um, and Dewey and, Dewey and Santayana. Yeah. And, and I think that there's, there's a, a very important dialogue that mm -hmm. should take place, I believe, between uh, American philosophy and Latin American philosophy that that is taking place, but 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 I think that that the focus on the aesthetic sh should play a crucial, if not a central, part in the discussion. And I wonder to what extent the uh, think about the the previous panel, the the idea of marginalization. Why is mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, American philosophy marginalized? Mm -hmm. uh, as well, in, in, a, in a less, of course, in a less uh, extreme way, but, but to what extent is because of their uh, focus, interest in the aesthetic in a broad sense, mm -hmm. not in a Kantian sense. Of, and I right, think that, right. that that is one of the problems whenever we speak of the aesthetic that is sort of automatically associated with a particular very limited realm of experience mm -hmm. when it should actually be much broader. Yeah, that, although and I've already admitted my Kantian leanings. I don't think it's Kant necessarily. In fact, it's a critique Gadamer makes of Kant that he is guilty of the subjectivization of aesthetics. So Kant was not even, and he had awful aesthetic sensibilities. Anyway, if you look at the examples of art he uses in the observations on the beautiful and the sublime, that's just a, an atrocious book. But um, he's trying in the third critique to talk about the aesthetic experience much more. He doesn't really care about works of art at all. That gives rise to all those discussions about can any work be a beautiful work of art and, and all the rest. Um, but, and some people have read Dewey actually as a sort of Kantian, but we don't need to. Well, what was my thing? I can say what I want. Um, but I, I don't necessarily want to, um, to say that either. <laughs> I can leave Kant aside. I, the only reason he was present is not because of my confessed interest in, in his work, but because Deus was also, of course, following that line. So 
um, I couldn't help it, one can say. But, but I do agree with you that this idea, so that aesthetic experience is what's important and for the purposes of what I was arguing too, much more than art. But then Omar's point, I think, is helpful and the first speaker's, uh, the first questioner's question was also useful, sort of, you have to then demarcate, okay, aesthetic experience is here and this is what's unique and this is what I'm talking about with the laws that are operative or not operative here and this is what's going on in creating the work of art and this is what's happening in educating the public when they're exposed to these works of art. So it, it's a more complicated sort of discussion but um, clearly I do, I do think this idea of American philosophy which would include both, uh, both Americas is one that has more of an emphasis on some of these aesthetic experiences. And I think it is part of, that's why I mentioned the romantics too, the marginalization can partially be um, attributed to that. And because once you put aesthetic experience um, in the mix of your philosophical system, you're not going to get the same closure you get when you leave it in a very um, segmented part of your system. And I think that openness makes people disrespect the philosophical contributions of the pragmatists of the early German romantics and of, of a lot of Latin American thinkers. Even something as innocuous as literary form has been a huge problem in the reception of Latin American thought because it doesn't look scientific or serious enough. It's just an essay. And it's too nicely written. Couldn't be good philosophy if, it's, if there's style to it, you know, and you enjoy reading it. So this is, um, it's a problem. It is, and, and that aesthetic sensibility that's present in the way Ortega, for example, writes, who's not considered, he's also considered African, you know, not European thinker, um, and, and he came to a lot of the same thoughts that, that Heidegger had earlier, but he's never put um, on the same footing at all because they can't take an essay seriously. So that's another level of the discussion as well, how within the very... Um, literary presence, that there are aesthetic elements, why that's cause for suspicion amongst philosophers. It's something I've never understood. I guess as someone who works on the romantics and Latin American thinkers who write well, I, I, don't, I don't like to read bad writing, so um, <laughs> which rules out a lot of philosophers, unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, but, but when does that become suspicious? It's, it's never made sense to me because um, that sort of allergy against style and, and beauty in the writing itself. So I, I do think the marginalization of American philosophy, both of American, that inclusive sense, can be in part attributed to this focus on, on aesthetic experience because it's somehow not considered important. You know, the serious people do ethics. Or you know, you're talking about justice. You go, you don't go to a sort of circumstance. You go to John Rawls and the veil of ignorance. Um, so that that's part of a problem that needs to be discussed more in terms of why people believe this. You know, and I think it's it's not true that that's more valuable than these other approaches to the problem because it leads to more blind spots and exclusions. Again, you get in that trap of, oh, that's not philosophy, and this is philosophy. And so we have more credentials than they do, and that's a problem. Uh, we have about 10 minutes to open the floor, but before we do that, uh, please join me in um, thanking Elizabeth. So we have um, at least two questions. We have, uh, that's right, behind Enrique and then Enrique. Uh, yes, um, very interesting oh, question. Uh, by, the, by the way, these questions are not more for Elizabeth. Oh, I mean, okay. the, the we just opened the floor. So they can be comments on her paper, but she's not forced to reply. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, uh, very interesting. Um, and so as a general reflection that uh, I am drawing from this uh, beautiful conference um, is, um, and the question I want to ask uh, the people, colleagues who are attending this conference is, to what extent 
are we really considering the current current circumstances of Latin, Latin American context? Because we are talking about Latin American philosophy, Latin American traditions of thought, and I find it very, very, very um, eh, rewarding. But the only thing that I, I would um, like to ask is, uh, are we really considering the current circumstances in, in Latin America in the sense that, for example, and I mean this as a criticism uh, to, um, to Nelson. He says, for example, that, demo uh, that ethics become moralistic or, or has the danger of becoming moralistic, right? Moralism. But in the real context of Latin America, in which we don't find fixed identities, in which we find a context in which we find evil, like in the sense in which Luis de Lloro finds the situation in which I have to answer to the face to the other in a concrete circumstance, hope is that ethics can become, uh, you know, moralistic, uh, um, less important than the categories of uh, coloniality and things like that. So, to what extent are we really considering what is going on? Because we have to think of all also of our circumstances. And you remember Jose Ortega said, if we emphasize that, we, uh, I am, I am my circumstances, mm -hmm. and I don't save them, I don't, I don't save myself if I don't save them, you know, you remember that kind of idea. So, to what extent we have to go against, uh, to consider a fresh uh, view of the real Latin American <laughs> circumstances regarding problems like violence, poverty, structural injustice, and things like that. Yeah. I did, uh, when I opened the conference, uh, one thing that I mentioned is what does it mean to be a contemporary? And I, I think I really agree with the idea that to be a contemporary is to, uh, to stand uh, in relationship to our immediate circumstance, but at the same time outside of it so we can take a, a, a critical position. And I think that uh, the different approaches that we have been hearing do that. And I think that it's a mistake to think, I honestly think that it's a mistake to think that, uh, that uh, philosophical thought, when it happens in that way, particularly when it engages, um, wh when it engages its situation in its darkest forms, like for example, I think that the question of coloniality does, as well as going directly to questions of, of how we're, we make a culture of, of, uh, of crime, right? I think that both of these instances are instances in which um, what happens is, that we are able to begin to articulate other possibilities, you know, and, and I think that the mistake that I want to point out is the mistake where people don't understand that thinking is already an action. When, it's, when it occurs in a critical manner in the manner that we're trying to do it, and I'm not saying that I know how to do it, but I'm saying that it's important to remember that. That's, that's what I, I, I just, to add. <laughs> just, just to add to Alejandro's uh, point, uh, what particular action I would even say uh, is criticism. I mean, philosophy uh, is a sort of activism. It can be criticism. And I think what I have seen at least is, uh, uh, and it's a criticism at different levels and different contexts, right? So, uh, and I would say that, uh, uh, for example, the criticism uh, even in, uh, uh, in, in different contexts, and what I mean by different contexts is the academy, uh, in our, our schools, uh, so I mean we. <coughs> I I agree with you that we need to be sensitive about the fact that we're in a uh, academic world and all that stuff. But uh, we have students, right? And uh, students are. Uh, uh, I mean, what I mean we teach, right? And encouraging criticism, for example, of. Uh, uh, of colonial logic, right? That's what we're talking here, right? How they're trapped into this ways of thinking. Um, I think it's a type of activism that, uh, that, I, that by the way, I don't think it's a type of activism that is appreciated in our universities. 
right? Because if we, if we provoke them to question their assumptions about things, which is what we're talking about here, right? Um, then uh, uh, we may not get uh, good evaluations, right? Can I make a comment now? It's, it's a general comment. First, um, I was so uh, nervous with my paper that I failed to thank all the organizers, um, Alejandro and Trish and Jose, um, and just the overall welcoming that we have received uh, from the people of Oregon and the philosophy department. Many of the colleagues have been here, and, and I just w had thought of saying that, but I was so nervous that I failed to say it. Um, so I'm saying it right now, so thank you for uh, treating us so well and um, feeding us so well and, and giving us food, not just for the, for the belly, but for the head, uh, for, the, for the mind. So, um, But going back over uh, what kinds of things kept me awake uh, or what kinds of things I take and don't take, um, what, there's one thing that I think we, we need to uh, recognize, that in all of the discourse that we have had, um, there's uh, something missing, and that is the reflection on the ecology, the environment, the nature of the Americas, mm -hmm. right? Um, we are a continent, a hemisphere, um, which shares a lot in common in terms of biology, not just history, but biology. And we talk about it in terms of land, but I think that um, we, I wish we had had a reflection on the, the ethics of the environment, um, uh, not simply environmental ethics, but for instance, the case of what is happening in Mexico with NAFTA. So a way to think about the ways in which um, environments are being destroyed and devastated by ecological, by, by economic imperatives of American uh, you know, economy. And so in, in Mexico, what we have is through NAFTA, um, the implosion of the corn industry. And, and it, it, that's, I think, it really something scandalous, um, what is happening in the Amazon. You know? um, and, and so I think that that's one thing I, I wish I had done. Um, I have written on it, and I have thought a lot about it um, since I'm writing on, on nature and animals. Um, but. We should also think of the, of the uh, voices that are absent here and the kinds of issues that um, we haven't addressed uh, in terms of thinking of from the Americas and about the Americas. But n nevertheless, it's incredible, uh, a wonderful feast of ideas and paradigms. So thank you. I have to say, I, I completely uh, um, agree with Eduardo, and in fact, this is funny because it was a, a part in a strategic failure because I was convinced that Ted Toadbine was going to be here, so I had assumed that he was going to do th that job, for begin to do that job, and also, um, they were, I don't know, they didn't speak up, but there were, I think that there were many people here from geography and our, our geography department that have been doing very interesting work in those kinds of issues. So I'm, so I'm very sorry. I, I, I also share with you the feeling that it would have been great to have had that. My observation will be in relation with the last that was so interesting exposition <coughs> and a reflection in general. I say yes, it's a, a moment of uh, developed to one state. And uh, we saw in Mexico in the National uh, Congress of Philosophy many panels in the group of philosophy of liberation or aesthetics. And I think it's very important. And uh, it's necessary to perhaps to read our philosophers too. I remember, for example, one Luis Guerrero. He has a fantastic three volumes on a phenomenology of aesthetics, a classical work that nobody uh, made any reference on uh, Vasconcelos. And we have more than 20 important aesthetics in the history of the 20th century because almost all important philosophers wrote an aesthetic. And that was a, a special too in the Latin American thought. Uh, three months ago, I, I was in Quito. And where 
one congress on aesthetic in the popular movements. Here there is some reference on the theater, but the, the, the pincher, uh, the uh, frescoes in the, in the wall, that is a special expression of the Latinos or Hispanos in the United States, is the only minority or group that has a public expression. And that is uh, very important, it's, it's very aesthetical, and it's political together. That is the interesting question. It's the interesting relation between the aesthetic and the politics. And in this semester I teach on, on Benjamin, Walter Benjamin, and I begin to prepare um, a work that I could write, uh, begin to, to, to work after the politics that will be a, an aesthetic of liberation. And uh, I personally, I, I come from the aesthetic. And my children time, I went in a school of painter, and I was in both art with 12 years, 20, until my 20 years. And uh, I have a, a special vision on this a question, and we must do a dialogue with Schiller, Schlegel, and the Romantic philosopher with our Baroque. And the Baroque is very important. And the Baroque 17 and 18 centuries in Latin America, the, the Quito, two Baroque in the Jesuit uh, church, for example, is fantastic, uh, unique. I think it's a chapter to be developed too, with the ecology, sure, but the aesthetic come now in the next future. Uh, I'm afraid that, uh, I apologize, but we, ha we have to stop because they are going to close the museum in five yeah. minutes, and if we don't get out, we will be part of aesthetics, possibly <laughs> permanently. <laughs>